Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar on the exposure draft titled Disclosure Requirements in IFRS Standards, a Pilot Approach. So this is an exposure draft that was published by the IASB in March earlier this year. My name is Aisha Akinwale, and I am joined today by my colleague, Catherine Dunkersley. We are both uh, members of the technical staff at the IASB working on the projects that developed this exposure draft. Um, just to know at the start that um, any views that we express um, in this webinar are our personal views and not necessarily the views of the IESB or the IFRS Foundation. So before we start, just a few housekeeping items. You can download the slides that we are presenting today from the event resources box that you see on your left side of the screen. If you have any questions, please um, ask them using the question box to the left of your screen. We'll pause to answer questions at various times during the presentation, and we'll also leave time at the end to take some more questions. If you have not already accessed the exposure draft, um, you can download the exposure draft as well as supporting educational materials like the snapshot, as well as an explanation of how you can submit a comment letter using the link to our project page on the bottom of the slide. Also, a recording of the presentation today, as well as the slide deck, would also be available on that same um, project page later, um, later on. So moving on to our focus for today, what are we covering? So we'll start off with um, explaining why the board is doing this project and the approach that the board took to developing the proposals in the exposure draft. There are two parts to the exposure draft. So after giving a bit of an introduction, We'll then spend some time um, providing an overview of the main proposals in each part of the exposure draft. And then finally, we'll talk about next steps, the feedback that the board is looking for, and the different ways that you can get involved. So with that, um, Catherine, can I hand it over to you to talk us through the background to the project and the board's approach to developing the proposals in the exposure draft? Sure. Thanks, Aisha. Uh, so many listeners will know that we've been talking about challenges with disclosures in financial statements for a number of years now. We've heard about financial statements not containing enough relevant information, containing too much irrelevant information, and about ineffective communication of the information that is provided. Now, the board has already undertaken a number of projects that focused on specific ways it can help to solve this problem. So one example of that was making targeted amendments to IAS1 to make clear that the concept of materiality applies to all disclosure requirements across the standards. However, the problem continues to exist, and so the board has undertaken this project, which really forms its central response to the overall disclosure problem. The board has developed the proposals in this project in response to feedback we received about the underlying causes of that problem. And you can see some key messages from that feedback here on this slide. First, we've been told consistently that regardless of the IAS1 requirement about applying materiality, companies, auditors and others often approach disclosures in financial statements like a checklist rather than by applying judgment. Second, almost all stakeholders that have provided feedback tell us that the disclosure requirements in IFRS standards are one contributor to the problem. For example, companies may not always understand why information is useful to investors, so it can be difficult for them to make effective judgments about whether that information is material in their case. We've also heard that many think long lists of prescriptive disclosure requirements do not leave time for companies to apply judgment, and that those lists effectively enforce the checklist approach that I just mentioned. Related to this, many stakeholders told us that the most effective thing the board could do to help solve the disclosure problem is to take steps to improve the disclosure requirements in the standards themselves. 
Now, one really important piece of feedback we've heard throughout this project is about the multifaceted nature of the problem. There's no one magic solution that is going to solve it. Instead, if meaningful improvement is to be made, then all stakeholders will need to play their part. What the board is proposing in this project would give stakeholders the tools that they've consistently told us they need to improve the disclosures in financial statements. The board's proposals in this project therefore form one step of a much bigger picture. They could be regarded as a catalyst for change. Before getting into the detail of the proposals, it's worth briefly explaining the process that the board is taking to the project. The board's first step was to spend time interrogating the way it develops and drafts disclosure requirements and consider how it can improve that process. This led the board to develop a, pro a proposed new approach to developing disclosure requirements that responds to the feedback we've heard about the causes of the disclosure problem. As we'll shortly explore, the proposed new approach represents a potentially really significant change. So the board's second step was to select two standards that contain many of the issues that stakeholders tell us contribute to the disclosure problem to test that approach on. Those standards are IFRS 13, Fair Value Measurements, and IAS 19, Employee Benefits. The board then applied its proposed new approach to develop proposed new disclosure requirements for those standards. The exposure draft that was issued in March lays out all aspects of the proposals, both the approach and the amendments to IFRS 13 and IAS 19. Later on in the webinar, we'll talk a little more about the specific proposals for the two test standards. A final important point to mention is that the board sees the proposed new approach as part of an iterative process and expects to keep learning and making improvements as we go. For example, as we've been working on developing the proposals for IFRS 13 and IAS 19, we learnt lessons and improved the approach as a result. And we expect to do that again when we hear your comments on the exposure draft. So do keep in mind throughout the webinar that if you have strong views on any of the topics we discuss, we would love to hear them by the 21st of October. Now, I'm going to hand things over to Aisha to talk in more detail about the first part of the exposure draft. That's the proposed new approach to developing disclosure requirements in IFRS standards. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, so this slide summarizes the key things that the board is proposing in its new approach. And, you know, really all of these are responding to what we've heard from stakeholders um, throughout the course of the project. So the first proposal relates to the importance of detailed and early stakeholder feedback. Now, of course, stakeholder input is always critical to the board's work. And here, what the board is proposing are to take steps to ensure that there is detailed understanding of investor information needs even earlier in the standard setting process. And so the board will then use the feedback from all those consultations to develop detailed disclosure objectives that would be based on investor needs. The second proposal is really about the status then of those detailed disclosure objectives. And the board is proposing to specifically require companies to comply with the detailed disclosure objectives in the standards. That effectively means that companies would be specifically required to apply judgment. Related to that second proposal, um, the third proposal emphasizes that the compliance bar is really on those disclosure objectives. And so really the proposals would then minimize the um, requirements to disclose particular items of information. And in doing so, making it clear that companies are required to focus on disclosing only material information. So let's look at um, each one of these proposals in more depth, um, starting with the first proposal. 
So what we've heard is that, you know, because companies may not always understand why information is useful, they often then find it difficult to make effective judgments about whether information is material in their case. So really the first proposal is seeking to address that issue by improving our efforts to make sure that there is detailed understanding of stakeholder needs and that those needs are reflected in the standards. Specifically, um, the board is, would be looking rather to spend time with individual investors very early on in the process to really understand their information needs in great detail. And some of the things that the board would look to understand are identified in that top right um, part of the slide. So these are things like um, what information investors would find useful in the notes, why are they interested in that information, the analysis that they would perform with the information, how detailed does the information need to be to adequately meet your needs? And finally, how should the information be prioritized? For example, what information is critical to their analysis versus information that you know is just nice to have? So the feedback that the board gathers from all those consultations will then be used to develop detailed and specific disclosure objectives that reflect investor needs in the standards. Um, those objectives would also be followed by explanations of what the information provided it is intended to help investors to do. And the purpose of those objectives, as well as the additional explanations, is really to put companies in a better position to understand the point of different pieces of disclosure information. And, you know, in doing so, help them to um, make more effective judgments about what to disclose and just as importantly, what to not disclose in their case. I think it also really goes without saying that what all of this means is that IFRS standards, for example, would not require companies to provide information unless the standards can also explain why that disclosure would be useful to investors. So we're not only um, focusing on investors here, um, the proposals would also involve the board engaging with all of the stakeholders in order to properly understand and balance costs and benefits. I think one thing that's um, interesting is that people often think balancing costs and benefits is a question of investor needs versus preparer needs. Um, they assume investors want to see lengthy financial statements and that companies want to disclose very little. Our experience in this project is really that um, that isn't necessarily always true. So when we spend time talking to investors in detail, we find that they want financial statements to focus concisely on information that's really important. And at the same time, companies want to focus on what really matters. They don't want to spend resources preparing pages and pages of disclosure if that disclosure does not convey the most useful information. So those two perspectives are really quite similar. And the board's proposals are intended to be responsive to both of them. So as part of this earlier um, stakeholder engagement process, the board would also be looking to seek um, the views of other stakeholders, so companies, auditors, regulators, and the likes on you know, a number of different themes, right? So the information that um, investors tell us that they need would like to get those um, other stakeholders' views on them as well. Um, their views as well on the different types of disclosures that they think could meet those investor needs. Um, would also be looking to get their views on information that um, might potentially be useful, but is yet to be identified in the standard. And very importantly as well, the cost and other consequences of both the current requirements and any potential disclosure um, proposals. So we've talked about um, how the board will develop disclosure objectives. The second proposal then focuses exactly on how companies would use those objectives. Um, I think as I mentioned earlier, those disclosure objectives are essentially describing investor information needs in detail. So the key point to, to mention here in this um, second bit is that the board is proposing to require companies to specifically comply with those disclosure objectives. There are in, in effect the new requirements. So when we refer to our oh, disclosure requirements, we are referring to um, the need to comply with these disclosure objectives. So what that means is that in order to achieve or assess compliance with those disclosure requirements and the standard, 
stakeholders would have to ask themselves whether the information that is disclosed is sufficient to satisfy the investor information needs as described in those objectives. So stakeholders would need to apply judgment in order to do this, and they would not be able to rely on a checklist as is um, often done today. I think that was one slide earlier. Um, so I also wanted to mention on this slide that the board is proposing two forms of disclosure objectives um, that would be specifically required within the context of an individual IFRS standard. Um, the first is um, overall disclosure objective. And what that objective would do is um, describe what investors are looking to understand about the topic as a whole. So take fair value measurement, for instance, what this objective would do is put into words what are the overall investor information needs about fair value measurement. Um, in terms of practical use of this overall disclosure objective, the board expects that you know, this objective would help companies determine when to disclose, for example, entity-specific information that might not be directly captured by any of the specific um, disclosure objectives. The second form of disclosure objectives that would be included then are what we call specific disclosure objectives. And so within an I first standard, the board would include a number of these specific disclosure objectives and they would really focus on and describe the detailed investor needs on a particular topic. So they're a lot more granular than, than the overall disclosure objectives. And in practical terms, really these objectives, the specific disclosure objectives would effectively be requiring companies to disclose all the material information that would enable the user understanding described in those specific objectives to be met. And we'll see some examples of, of these with um, IFRS 13 and IS 19 um, shortly. So I've mentioned that companies would need to um, determine the information to disclose to meet the disclosure objectives, but um, the board is not just going to leave companies to themselves with this. So the proposals also provide companies with a number of tools to help them make effective judgments about how to satisfy the disclosure objectives and what may be material in their own case. The first one, um, which I've mentioned earlier, are explanations of why investors want the information and what the information provided in response to the objective is intended to help investors to do. So really all that you know, good information that the board gets from the earlier stakeholder engagement with investors and everyone else would be included in the standard for the benefit of companies as well. The second um, are items of information. Um, those items of information really identify potentially material information that a company may disclose to meet the objective if they are relevant to their own um, circumstances. So really just emphasize the may there because what these items of information are not there to do is they're not a checklist of what to disclose. Um, they're really there to guide companies in terms of what may be material in their case. So going through the items of information, a company may find that one, some, you know, or maybe all of them are relevant to their own case, but that would have to be based on an analysis of what is material to its own investors. Um, here, really, the board spent a lot of time actually thinking about how to balance this dual need for entity-specific information and comparability um, as part of this proposed new approach. And um, what the board came to is that by including items of information, that's one way in which comparability can be achieved when we have two companies that have um, similar information that's material to both companies and would be useful for investors' analysis. Finally, the standards uh, would link every item of information to one or more specific disclosure objectives. And this would um, really provide clarity about the relationship between the specific disclosure objectives and the items of information. And in doing so, you know, the board is making it easier for companies to make judgments around whether information is um, material to disclose. The final key proposal to mention um, here is about language. Um, so the board has heard that um, when there are high volumes of prescriptive requirements in the standards, it does not leave um, companies with enough time to apply judgments. 
Um, I've mentioned earlier that companies would be specifically required to comply with the proposed disclosure objectives and make judgments about what to disclose, those objectives effectively being the compliance requirements. So this proposal on language reinforces that point by minimizing the extent to which items of information would be required. So in most cases, those items of information would be identified with a less prescriptive language that says, while not mandatory, the following information may enable an entity to meet the specific disclosure objective, and then goes on to list those items of information. So really the language is making it clear that there is no compliance burden on the items of information. Companies would be expected to be strongly guided by these items, but what should be disclosed in the financial statements at the end of the day are only material information that meets the um, disclosure objective. So that's an overview really of the board's um, proposed new approach to developing disclosure um, requirements. Um, Catherine, I wanted to, to, to um, ask you a question. One question we get frequently asked is um, whether the volume of disclosures will reduce as a result of this proposed new approach. Um, could you talk about the board's expectations on this? Uh, yes, yes, I can. Thank you. That is, as, as you say, a, a question that, that we get a lot um, and that there is a few things to say here. Um, so, so when the board was setting its objectives for this project, um, its objective was not to either increase or decrease the volume of disclosure requirements or the volume of disclosures in financial statements. Its objective was about making disclosures effective, about giving investors the information that, that they most need and is most relevant. Um, and because of that, the literal answer to the question of will this approach um, reduce the volume of disclosures is it depends. And the reason it is it depends is because you could think about some scenarios. You might see financial statements today that, as we've mentioned, um, contain some information that is irrelevant, that some would call boilerplate. Um, and in those instances, we would expect application of this approach to lead to those boilerplate disclosures being removed, i.e. a reduction in volume. On the other hand, um, you see financial statements today where there is this lack of relevant information and there are perhaps things that should be there that aren't. And in those cases, increased effectiveness would lead to additional disclosures, i.e. an increase in volume. The reality, however, is that for, for many companies, both of those things will be needed to um, apply this approach as it is intended and improve overall effectiveness, i.e. some disclosures would, would be reduced, some would be increased on those areas that are more relevant to investors. So it is going to be different in every case in terms of volume. It's really about effectiveness, albeit that changes in volume in either direction uh, are likely to be a practical consequence depending on, uh, on what a particular company company is, is doing today. Um, okay, so perhaps if we move on then to talk about the proposals for the two test standards. Um, I'll keep this high level and focus on the most significant feedback we've heard and how the board's proposals respond to that feedback. So the first thing to mention is that before developing the proposals for these two standards, the board spent a great deal of time talking to stakeholders. Now, as you can see on the slide, the board undertook outreach with 35 investors from different backgrounds uh, in one-to-one -one or small group meetings to understand their information needs on the test standards in depth. The board also spoke to its consultative groups to understand the views of other stakeholders on those investor information needs. So, for example, those discussions explored different ways of meeting investor needs along with potential costs and other consequences. Now, that very much reflects how the board applied the first key proposal in the proposed new approach that Aisha described earlier. So first, let's look at fair value measurement disclosures. If I were to summarise this in one sentence, I would say that it is all about materiality. 
Specifically, investors say they often get pages of information about immaterial fair value measurements and little information about those fair value measurements they regard as significant. At the same time, companies tell us that those pages of information are onerous to prepare and that investors rarely ask any questions about them. To sum up, therefore, the messages we've heard are not so much that the actual content of fair value measurement disclosures is the wrong content. It's more that the information is not always provided about the most useful population of items. In testing the guidance for the board here, then, you could say that one measure of success would be a set of new disclosure requirements that helps companies to make meaningful materiality judgments. That is, requirements that help them to focus their information on the fair value measurements that investors are interested in. And the board's proposals are intended to do exactly that in a number of ways. Firstly, by developing disclosure objectives that explain investor needs in detail. Across all of the board's discussions with investors, the key message that came through was about understanding a company's exposure to uncertainty. So, exactly what fair value measurements does a company have and what are the uncertainties surrounding those measurements? The board has proposed an overall disclosure objective along these lines, and that theme of uncertainty is then reflected across all of the proposed specific disclosure objectives. The second way the proposals respond to the key messages from stakeholders is by requiring companies to focus on the appropriate level of detail and ensure that relevant information is not obscured by insignificant detail. Now, this is really intended to reinforce the materiality requirements in IAS 1 and give companies additional confidence about applying judgment and focusing their disclosures on the fair value measurements that are material. Thirdly, the proposals avoid referring to levels of the fair value hierarchy where that is possible and helpful. And that's to remove any perception that detailed disclosures should be provided for fair value measurements in particular levels, regardless of whether they are material or not. Investors have described the levels of the hierarchy as representing a continuum of measurement uncertainty rather than being three distinct buckets. So, the best example of that is that some level two items will be close to level one, while some will be closer to level three and therefore contain more uncertainty. As I mentioned earlier, understanding exposure to uncertainty is really key for investors. So, for example, if a company has material assets in level two of the fair value hierarchy, understanding things like the extent to which those items are towards the level three end of the scale is something that investors care about. So, what's important is for companies to disclose relevant information for material fair value measurements, even if they are not in the level three bucket. So, those are the board's main proposals with respect to the proposed disclosure objectives on IFRS 13. The board also proposes to include items of information to help companies apply judgment on how to meet the objectives. Moving on then to employee benefit disclosures. Uh, now, the situation here is a little bit different to IFRS 13. The key messages coming out are firstly that what investors really care about here are defined benefit plans. That's where the risk is and therefore that's what investors are interested in. The single most important information to investors about those defined benefit plans is often their cash flow effects, but investors say they often get little information on this today. 
Another problem we heard relates to that part of the disclosure problem that is ineffective communication. Often we hear that investors receive pages and pages of detailed pension disclosures, but they can't piece together the information they're seeing and understand how it relates back to the primary financial statements. At the same time, companies tell us those detailed pages of information can be onerous to prepare. The board's proposals then respond directly to that feedback by developing disclosure objectives that focus on the areas that investors are really interested in. For example, the proposed detailed disclosure objectives focus on risk exposures, on cash flows, and on the need to communicate information in a way that enables investors to navigate and understand it. We've heard many describe that latter need as an executive summary. The proposals also respond to feedback that many of today's disclosures are onerous to prepare by removing costly information that investors tell the board is not the most useful to their analysis. An example of this is a detailed assumption by assumption sensitivity analysis on the defined benefit obligation. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so just looking at the q and I think we've had um, a few questions coming while you're presenting. So um, the first one, I think, touches on what you've just talked about on pensions. So um, there's a question about if a company currently is making compliant disclosures for pensions, will those disclosures remain compliant under the proposals? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, I, I, I have a couple of things to say on that. Um, so. It, the first thing I will say is I mentioned right at the beginning that IAS1 contains a requirement for companies to essentially apply materiality across the board. If something is material, it needs to be disclosed today, irrespective of the um, whether it's explicitly re required in a standard and vice versa. If something is explicitly required in a standard, but it's not material, it doesn't need to be there. And before I, I answer the, the question that's been asked explicitly, it's important to say there are companies today that really are, you know, a applying those IAS1 requirements as they are intended and making those judgments about additional information that, that needs to be there um, and, and indeed things, things that can go because they're not material. Now, I'll, I'll come on to why that's so relevant in a moment, but in terms of the actual question that's been asked on pensions, um, hopefully you, you took from, from what I just described on the board's IAS 19 proposals that we learned from investors, there are um, elements where relevant information that they need, they are not always getting today. So, the, the primary example of that is cash flow information. So, um, it is really quite possible that companies could be completely compliant today, but these proposals, when they go through, you know, what it is that investors need, what is the most relevant information you will find to comply with these proposals, something more would be needed. Indeed, you are also likely to, to find the opposite. There may be um, pieces of detail today that under these proposals, you'd have more to work with in terms of, of of taking that away. Um, another example I'd cite is the point I made on um, executive summaries. So, if it is the case today that the, you know, the pension note is frankly difficult to understand and you, you can't see how it links to the primary financial statements, which, you know, we are told happens today, that would fail to, to comply with one of the proposed objectives. So, um, it, it is not really going to be the case that companies can just carry on doing what they're doing, applying these proposals and, and would comply. This is a really new way of thinking that would, would need to be addressed. Coming back to the, the point I made about IAS1, however, I, I will add that there are companies that really are already providing for example, information about cash flows because they know investors want it. And in fact, one of the sources of information we had in developing these proposals was what are companies disclosing because it's useful to investors, you know, and that, that gives us information about investor needs. So, there are companies who, who may already be meeting um, investor needs, um, 
but I, I could not answer the question that, that's been asked with, with a yes. You're not going to, to automatically comply if you're compliant today. What will really be required is to, to think about investor needs and, and whether they are met. Um, sorry, long answer, but it, it was a great question. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, the other question that's um, coming is, um, you know, you've, you've talked about IFRS 13 and IS 19 and our proposals there, and um, there's a question about whether the board will go through all the other IFRS standards and develop new disclosure requirements for them applying this approach. Um, Again, a, a, another good question. I feel like I'm saying that every time. So, so, so thank you to, to, to the audience for sending the questions in. Um, so at, at the start of the project, the board did actually consider doing uh, what it thought of at the time as a comprehensive uh, standards level review and looking at all of the standards. The reason the board did not decided not to do that was uh, was well there were there were several reasons some of them were practical some of them were about time but really really importantly to address the disclosure problem the board is going to have to do things in a new way and it is really essential that we do our due diligence on that that we test those proposals, hence the, the two standards, and that we hear what stakeholders have to say about that. Because if we were to make changes in every single IFRS standard without really interrogating whether that's the right thing to do first, that would be um, that, that, that wouldn't really be right, let's put it that way. Um, so again, uh, the answer to the question that's been asked about whether this approach um, is likely to, to be applied to all IFRS standards is at this stage, I'm afraid, it depends. And the reason it depends is because your feedback is so, so important. Um, and that feedback will um, allow the board to make an informed decision about next steps. So at one extreme end of the scale, if we hear from stakeholders that the approach that is proposed and the examples in IAS 19 and IFRS 13 enable stakeholders to do their part in addressing the disclosure problem and will lead to more effective, more useful disclosures, then the board will be thinking about things like applying that approach across its future standard setting projects and indeed would be considering rolling it out to other standards. Equally, it might be that we learn lessons about different or better ways of doing things and that the board might consider something else. So at the moment, um, I'm afraid I do have to answer that question with it depends and really encourage you to, to provide feedback to help the board decide how best to move forward and indeed whether this, this proposed approach should be rolled out broadly. Um, Okay, I think actually that question leads us uh, really rather well into the last part of today's presentation, which is about the feedback the board is looking for and just how you can get involved. So everything we've talked about today is one step in a much bigger picture. The exposure draft is much more than proposed amendments to two individual standards. Instead, it represents an opportunity to move towards a step change in the way that we all think about and approach disclosures. But as I've just mentioned, that's not something the board can do alone. And to move forward with this approach, it's really important that the board understands the effects that the proposals would have on you. So some examples are on this slide. Will the proposals help you to apply judgment effectively and avoid applying disclosure requirements like a checklist? Are the proposals specific enough to help companies identify the information that would best meet investor needs? And it's not just about companies, everyone would be affected by these proposals. So we are looking to understand whether they would give auditors and regulators a solid basis on which to challenge and review the judgments that companies would make. Now, I mentioned earlier that no amendment to the standards is going to provide a miracle solution to the disclosure problem. What we are looking for in this consultation is to fully understand whether the proposals would be effective in helping other stakeholders to play their part in solving the disclosure problem and ultimately in providing more useful disclosures in financial statements for investors. So we really need your help. We're looking for input on both the proposed new approach to disclosures 
and the proposed amendments to IAS 19 and IFRS 13. Even if pensions and fair value measurements are not key areas for you, we still want to hear what you think about the proposed new approach itself. If the board does move forward and apply the approach in its future standard setting activities, that would have a significant effect for all stakeholders. In terms of the timeline we're working with, the exposure draft is open for comment until the 21st of October. Uh, now, that's a seven month comment period in total, which some of you may be aware is a, is a long period for the board to give. The board purposefully made this decision because of the slightly unusual nature of the exposure draft and the need to get your input on all aspects of the proposed approach and the proposed amendments. So you can participate in our outreach activities to share your views directly with us. We'll be announcing activities on the website, so make sure you're following the project page to stay up to date with new developments. A final important point to share is that to complement other feedback the board will receive from outreach and comment letters, the board is also undertaking fieldwork to test the proposals in the exposure draft. At a very high level, we're essentially asking fieldwork participants to apply the proposed amendments to their employee benefit or fair value measurement disclosures. That will help the board to better understand the practical consequences of the proposed new approach. We've published a call for fieldwork participants on the website uh, with further details about what the fieldwork will involve and how to sign up. We've put a link into the slide pack, so if you click on the words participate in fieldwork on the current slide, it will take you to the right place. Uh, so I'd really encourage you to check that out and please do encourage others to do the same. Uh, so with that, let's look at a few other questions that have come through from the audience. Um, Aisha, I haven't managed to keep up with the questions while I've been talking, so could I turn to you in the first instance for a question, please? Yes, of course. So um, we have a question about um, our use of the term disclosure requirements. So by having the word requirement, companies interpret this as something that has or must to be provided. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, um, you know, when we, that's one of the things we're actually looking to, to do in, the, in, in this project. You know, there is often um, a perception that, you know, by requiring, you know, requirements and having a list of long list of requirements, those are just a checklist to, to, to go down, do and, um, and disclose. So looking at the proposals that the board has now, in effect, really the disclosure um, objectives, because they are describing investor information needs that need to be met. Those are in substance, as I was referring to earlier, the new requirements. Um, it's still important for us, I think, to refer to them as requirements because that is the compliance part. Companies would not be satisfying um, or be complying with IFRS standards and the disclosures under this proposed approach if they don't satisfy those um, those needs. But if you will, those um, under our current proposals, we're almost sort of shifting the onus from you know long list of um, items of information to disclosure objectives, which are in effect the the requirements um, themselves. But um, we've been hopefully trying to be quite clear when we refer to objectives that these are the requirements and not, for example, those those items of, of information. Um, okay, if, if I take a question now then, uh, we have had a question which I will read out. With all of these judgments, wouldn't this proposal make information less enforceable? Um, so I think what this is, is asking is perhaps about effects for auditors, regulators, will they actually be able to um, enforce the proposals and, and, and challenge companies on the, on the judgments they've made? Um, that, that's a topic that the board has has discussed a lot over the course of the project, and it's something that, that is really, really important for the board. So the, the first thing I'm going to say is, again, to, to appeal for, for input on that topic, because we, we would love your views. However, what I will share um, is the, 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 the view that, that is um, held by the board, and you, you see reflected in the document and the, the basis for conclusions, which is that 
comparing to today where you have these these prescriptive lists of information and then you have an overarching requirement to apply judgment and materiality when um, preparing your disclosures it is already necessary to audit and enforce judgment but that audit and enforcement is on this high level apply materiality when you're you're, you're complying with with the disclosure requirements in individual standards Comparing that to what we have under this proposed approach, the requirements in this at an individual standards level require more judgment. You know, you simply have to apply judgment to comply with an objective that says disclose information that enables users to understand this thing. You can't do that without applying judgment. So it is judgment is more um, enforced, if you like. So you could argue that that would be harder for auditors and regulators to review compared to answering a question about whether one particular item of information is there. However, the proposals also contain loads to work with in terms of both supporting companies making the judgments, but also supporting auditors and regulators enforcing them. So the, the, the objectives themselves are, are very, very detailed. You know, they contain a lot more information about investor needs that, than in typically the disclosures you get to date. My, the disclosure objectives you typically get today that will say something like, you know, explain the information in the primary financial statements. The proposed objectives go into more details about what exactly it is that users need. Every single specific disclosure objective that the board has proposed is then supported by an explanation of what users are likely to be doing with the information, what analysis they're looking to perform, for example. Again, that will not only help companies apply judgment about whether something's material to them, but it will help auditors and regulators to, to, to challenge, to say, look, this is what a, a, an investor needs to be able to, to do as a result of this disclosure objective. And if, if I don't think reviewing your accounts, they will be able to do that, then there's a discussion to be had. The items of information themselves are again helpful um, in thinking about possible things that might be needed to, to meet the objective and thinking um, about whether those items are needed in a particular case. There's also application guidance and illustrative examples for those objectives where the board felt that was needed. So comparing to today, both now and under this proposed approach, judgment needs to be reviewed, it needs to be audited, it needs to be enforced. But the new proposals would give a lot more to work with in that regard. So completely understanding the concern that comparing a, a, a checklist of information to objectives that require judgment, you could perceive that as harder to do. We also think there's a lot more to work with. So the you know the the benefits of going through that exercise of of, of enforcing judgment um, are valuable, and the board has has given um, auditors and enforcers what what we believe they need and what we believe will help them. But just to reiterate again, please share your thoughts on this topic with us as part of the uh, the, the consultation process because that's the board's view. But we we would love love to hear yours as well. Uh, so I see a couple of questions around the field testing of, of the proposals. Um, so the first around field testing was um, if another um, effort, for instance, is asking for participation in field work, if it's joint with IASB or separate. So um, our you know, national standard sector groups are obviously a very important um, stakeholder group for us in terms of um, connections with um, um, other stakeholders in, in their jurisdiction. So we are working um, with um, national standards that is to um, put together this, this field work um, activities as well. So um, what's important as well is not to be able to duplicate um, efforts. So if you've already signed up with um, effort, we would be working together so that you're not having to, you know, um, duplicate work if you're interested in, in, in the field testing. Um, so we would be working together there in terms of um, you know, this, um, interacting with you and um, asking um, follow-up questions about about the results of, of the field work. So, um, do, do I'll just you know use that to encourage you to, to sign up for for the field testing. Um, I think the other related questions about field work was um, if you, um, someone can just take part for IFRS 13, um, or if you don't have um, defined benefit pension schemes. And the answer is absolutely. Um, so, as a volunteer, you would be able to choose 
which standard you want to focus on. So that could just be IAS 19, just IFRS 13 or both. So yes, if you're interested in just IFRS 13, please do do reach out to, um, to, to us as well. And then I think um, along field testing as well, in terms of IFRS 13, if we're just targeting banks for the field work. So what's absolutely important for us is to get a good representation with field work, both from you know geographic and industry perspectives. So for IFRS 13, absolutely, we're interested in both financial institutions and, and other companies as well. I think one, one of the feedback that sort of came through in all of our earlier outreach with stakeholders um, before developing the exposure draft was that, you know, quite often detailed disclosures about fair value measurements can often be particularly onerous and, and challenging for, for non-financial companies as well. And sometimes they feel like they're just disclosing lots of information that's not helpful to to investors as well. So it's really important for us to get non-financial companies also involved and how they might be able to work with the proposals to better apply materiality and eliminate um, detailed information about immaterial um, stuff. Um, okay, so we have a question uh, that is specific to IAS 19. It's quite a long question. I will read the whole thing out and then, then I will answer it. So the question is, one of the special disclosure objectives for IAS 19 is asking about information about measurement uncertainty in determining the defined benefit obligation. How can this be done in practice? especially because the current sensitivity analysis will no longer be required. Could you please provide an example about how a company could meet this special disclosure objective? Um, so that, that is the question that, that we've had. Um, so on measurement uncertainty, um, I'm going to first briefly expand a little about the feedback we heard from investors. And I will add on this that we do, um, for all of the specific disclosure objectives, you can see um, in the proposals, we explain what we heard from users and go into detail tell about that in, in the basis for conclusions as you know explanatory background so to the extent that what I say is helpful um, just to note that if, if you haven't already seen the basis there is so, some some useful information there that might might help with any other similar questions to, to this one um, but with regard to measurement uncertainty um, we, we talked a lot to users about this because it is something that's important to them. They want to know, OK, I've got this, this number for the defined benefit obligation. H how much do, do I almost need to worry about it? How, how much could it go in either direction, for example? And one of the things, as the question noted, that is typically received today is a detailed assumption by assumption sensitivity analysis. Now, what some users told us was that that isn't really the most useful thing they can get always because it doesn't necessarily communicate the, 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 the big thing they're worried about. What's the overall level of uncertainty? Because if you imagine um, individual assumptions moving in isolation and you've got this sensitivity analysis that does it piece by piece, it might not be quite so easy for investors to pick out exactly what it is, this how much uncertainty do I need to worry about? And there are actually a number of ways that companies could communicate that information that might be more or less useful, depending on their particular circumstances, that are um, sort of addressed in the, the, the guidance that, that follows this objective in the um, in the proposals. So one thing that users tell us is really useful is understanding the actual the actuarial assumptions that have been used because often users will have their you know their own views on on what is an appropriate assumption if you like and knowing what's been used will be able to to let them assess for themselves okay i might have used this this slightly different um assumption and therefore i think to me this number is 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 a little bit uncertain in in this particular way um we also in the standard talk about things like um, how measurement uncertainty has affected measurement of the obligation. So there might be circumstances in which a company itself is doing that overall big picture assessment of measurement uncertainty. OK, if, if, if worst or best case scenario in terms of all assumptions happened, this would be the outcome. And that is a different piece of information to that assumption by assumption sensitivity analysis, which I mentioned in the in the presentation is, is no longer explicitly required. And that you know, may be more useful to use as if a company does have a reasonable assessment of that overall picture. Um, there's also, I think, different um, pieces of things like 
why actuarial assumptions had changed during the, the reporting period, i.e. is there anything new this year that investors might want to be aware of that might affect measurement uncertainty? And then if there are any alternative actuarial assumptions that are reasonably possible at the end of the reporting period, what are those assumptions um, so that investors can get a view of, right, what are the things that might really, really affect the level of measurement uncertainty and take a view about what they need to worry about. So it's all part and parcel of this uncertainty theme and there are different ways of going about it. But the, the question I think about the specific assumption by assumption, by assumption analysis is really that that is not, not necessarily the most useful thing for investors. So what, rather than requiring that, what we go into in the standard is what it is that investors care about with uncertainty what they're looking to do in terms of assessing the sources of uncertainty and how the entities determine the obligation it lands on rather than you know anything with, within the possible range and different particular ways an entity could go about communicating that information. Uh, so, so again, sorry, a, a long answer, <laughs> but, but an, another good question. Okay, thanks, Catherine. So I think looking at the clock, this um, will be your final question. Um, and this is a question that's coming about IFRS 13. Um, so the question asks, um, what about level one fair value measurements? Um, are we expected to disclose loads of information about them? And um, I, I think that the short answer to that is the board does not expect that the proposals would result in um, a lot more information about level one items and even for most of level two. Um, so it's, I explained earlier in the um, presentation, really, when, when it comes to IFRS 13, what investors care about is uncertainty about fair value measurements and really understanding what the exposure is, is for companies. So really, it's that gray area between level two and level three where, you know, some items are categorized in level two, but they are very close to that level three border that um, would most likely be, be affected um, uh, in addition here. Um, I think it's also important to, to sort of make clear that we're also not expecting that a great deal of information will continue to be provided for level three, as is the case today either, right? So, for example, we know that some companies, especially financial companies, they may have more fair value measurements in level two rather than level three. So, in those cases, from a practical perspective, what is actually going to be most useful to investors um, is information about level two to the extent that any of those instruments are affected by, by uncertainties. So the point really with the IFRS 13 proposals is that, you know, the relevant information that to be provided is for material fair value measurements, even if they're not in level three. But, you know, the board definitely does not expect that um, it would result in detailed information about, you know, level one items, since, you know, those items tend to most likely not be significantly affected by um, a great deal of uncertainties. So I think that brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today and for your incredibly um, uh, great questions. Uh, I think we're able to get through um, most, of, most of those questions, so thank you. Um, so we're looking forward to um, working with you and hearing your feedback on, on this exposure draft. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time today. <laughs>